let me get started tonight and I'll meet you in Acts. If you have a Bible, go to Acts chapter 3. We're going to meet Peter preaching in Solomon's portico. He comes out of the temple, that famous moment of, of healing, but he ministers a little bit. And I want to minister with Peter tonight on a topic that uh, I, I'm going to just lay it out as a three-word title, and you'll see those three words as we read the text in a moment, repent, refresh, restore. Uh, I'm not trying to preach a one, two, three process message to you tonight. Um, I really am trying to give you an overview of what I think the salvation experience is in a microcosm. We repent, we have times of refreshing, we are ultimately believing for total restoration. And why I say ultimately believing is because, well, not everything's been totally restored. Not, not in our lives. We've had, Christ has done the finished work, but I like to say it this way, Christ finished the work for my redemption at Calvary, but I'm an unfinished work. <laughs> um, how's that possible? Well, just take a look at me. I'm an unfinished work. And yet Christ did what he's going to do and he's not gonna do it again. He's not coming back to die on the cross twice. He's not coming back to resurrect again. So he either finished it or he didn't finish it. And I believe he finished it. And I know I'm not finished. So the finished work of Christ is, is still working on me, still finishing me. And you, you as well. That's, that's what I mean by an overview of my journey is that I repent, I'm refreshed, I'm restored. But then it's not over with. I repent again over something else. I'm refreshed, I'm restored. So I want to talk about what is, what is his role. And by him, of course, I mean the resurrected Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit. But I also want to talk about what is my role, my participatory role in this whole process of my salvation. Because I am not believing on Jesus and then setting back and, and just laying there like a lump. And then, you know, God, if you want to change me, change me. Um, I, I don't do anything. Um, but rather, I am believing on Christ, and then I'm participating as Christ works in me. Hey, let's go over here. And he doesn't have to drag me. I want to go over there with him. I want to be, that's what we call being led by the Spirit, not dragged <laughs> by the Spirit, not pushed by the Spirit. There's a reason we say led. It's because we're actually walking. We're actually making decisions. We're actually saying, okay, I'm going to go left. No, I'm going to go right. I, I want to hear where the Spirit wants me. I'm not going to lay here like a slug and just wait till I go to heaven and then just expect that God's going to drag me and just pull stuff out of my life and do spiritual surgery and fix all this stuff. There's going to be a little part of this in which if he's leading, I'm following. This is why Jesus said, follow me. In other words, I'm about to get off of this boat and I'm going to walk to the next town. If you want to go to the next town, come on, get in lockstep with me. I'm not going to drag you. I'm not going to bribe you. I'm not going to push you. I'm not going to intimidate you. I'm not going to scare you. I'll never leave you. I'll never outrun you. I'll never forsake you. I won't take you to the next town, then get up in the middle of the night and leave. And you'll wonder where I went. And, and I'm, I'm just using Jesus illustrations to illustrate the walk of our, of our Christianity. So like it or not, we are involved to some extent. Now, we're not saving ourselves. We're not making ourselves righteous. We're not paying for our forgiveness. We're not convincing God we're worth it. We're not trying to live up to his love. If I could be better, he'd love me. If I could do more, he'd bless me. If I could be consecrated, he'd anoint me. We're not earning love. We're not earning his, his parental affection. I'm not talking about earning. I'm talking about living. Jesus said, you shall have life and you shall have it more abundant. An abundant life has to be lived. And so I've been doing my own wrestling for a long time over what my Christianity looks like if it's not only focused on going to heaven. You guys have heard me talk about this off and on and I can't really get off of it because it's where my spirit is. You see, I've, I've been in the Christian environment my entire life. I don't really know anything but a Christian environment. And that means I, I met Christ and I come up in the church understanding God and the Bible through that lens. 
It wasn't a lens of having run out into the world and done this and the need delivered from sin and needing convinced that my old religion was wrong. None of that. It was all I ever knew. Um, and I've had to contend with why I keep doing this. Like, why do I keep living it out? Have I, have I wrestled sufficiently with my own faith and what I really believe about God and what I really believe about Paul? Because that's important. And in that wrestling, uh, I have moments of true transformation where my hip is popped, like, like Jacob wrestling, and you get that leg snapped, and that just means you don't walk the same anymore. And there's parts of me that didn't walk in the same anymore because I'm, I'm becoming convinced of Christ in a way that I wasn't yesterday or a week ago or a year ago. And I like it. I'm okay with it because the same God that pops my hip walks next to the limping me and goes, it's okay, I got you. you know, you're going to limp through this, but I'm, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I, I'm going to walk with you. I'm your rod and your staff. Why do you need a rod and staff if not to lean against once in a while? You lean against it because you can't walk the way you used to walk. And so now your Christianity might be about something else. It was about this, but now it's about this. But that's just the transformation of your faith. That's just your faith coming up against Maybe things you don't believe anymore, or maybe things that aren't enough to believe. It's not enough for me now to go somewhere when I die. It used to be enough. It's not enough. I want to go be with him when I die, but that's not enough for me to endure what I endure in my faith, if not to know him now. I want to know him. I want to, I want to know him now. I don't just want to know him then. And in the meantime, he's just some shadowy figure that I think lived 2,000 years ago. And fingers crossed that he, he really raised from the dead. And I'll put my faith in it so I can go to heaven when I die. I just, I'm, call me greedy. I want more than that. I want to know the life of God. And so I want to experience his love. And I want to experience his life. And I want peace that passes all understanding. And I want joy unspeakable and full of glory. And I don't want it because I think I've earned it because I'm positive I haven't and I don't know how but I know that if he promised it and all the promises are in Christ well then that's the Christ I want and so so this journey for me has become about knowing him better and knowing him better has by default meant I've had to know me better you understand what I mean I've had to know me better and I've had to get really honest with me and I've had to put the real me with him to say, this is real Paul. This is what I really think. This is how I really feel. And I want to lay that at your feet, Lord, so that you can do the work. Well, part of that is repentance and refreshing and restoration. Let me show you to you in one little microcosm. Look at Acts chapter 3, verse 18. And Peter has a whole sermon. I'm not going to preach the whole thing. I really just want to confine it. And I hope you understand that we have to do that sometimes. I love context, but I get out of hand with context. I'd want to do four chapters. Just right. <laughs> you know, these three and then a couple more later. Okay. Can't we'll have time for that. So let's just, let's just bring it down. I don't like it, but we're going to start with a conjunction. All right. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. So any context we need, this is all we're going to get for now. And that is, Peter goes, everything it said he was going to do, he did. He fulfilled it. Or you could say, he finished it. How do we open tonight? He finished the work. I'm not finished. Okay, I'm going to let Peter prove that. Because Peter says, he did it. Whatever he needed to do, he did it. Sounds to me like a finished work. But in the very next phrase, verse 19, repent therefore and be converted. Okay, he did the work, therefore here's what you need to do. This is a perfect illustration to me of finished unfinished. Jesus did his work at Calvary. What do I need to do with that? So Peter goes, repent, be converted so that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. I'll stop there. Did you catch my three R's? Look at the top of 19. Repent, 
middle of 19 so that the times of refreshing may come and then middle of verse 21 until the times of restoration there's a repentance that happens there's a refreshing that happens there's a restoration that happens they do not all happen at the same time this is why they're sequential the repentance is not god's job the repentance is my job god doesn't need to change his mind how many of you realize god feels exactly about you the way he has always felt about you independent of how you perform and this is really good news he loves you he delights over you the bible says he's good to all the bible says and the bible jesus even breaks it down for those of us that are hard-headed i said okay for for the me's in the room that are hard-headed jesus even breaks it down and says he makes it rain on the just and the unjust alike. He is good to the evil. Well, I need him to say that because I've been the unjust and I've been the evil just enough to know that I need God to be merciful to me and none, anybody, nobody else counts. I don't, need, I don't even need to judge anybody else. I don't need to look outside of me. I need that. And, if, and, and knowing that I need it, somebody else might need it. And the good news is, is he doesn't think anything differently of me. When I have a good day, he's madly in love with me. When I have a bad day, he's madly in love with me. I am his child. So are you. And I beg you to personalize that daily. That I am at, maybe, maybe you have the worst day in the world. I didn't, I didn't talk well. I didn't act well. I didn't think well. I haven't performed well. This has been a, this has been a, a, a terrible moment. Father loves me. I'm his son. I'm his daughter. Doesn't think anything different of me. He's satisfied knowing me. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit didn't have a meeting over coffee. And God looked at his son and went, I don't know. What are we going to do with this one? This has been a terrible day. I mean, are we still going to stick it out with him? I mean, <laughs> this guy's making us all look bad. And, and, yet, and thank God that that's how... He, okay, so my point there is if Peter says Jesus fulfilled it, you need to repent. That's the you part. God doesn't need to change his mind. And the reason I say change your mind is because most of you know repent is the Greek word metanoia, which is a complete mind change. It's not just, oh, I don't see that the same way anymore. That's part of it. That's the starting blocks of it. It's a total transformation of my mindset in regards to that information. And so it's a process then. You probably didn't change your mind over of anything you've ever changed. We're, by the way, we're not good at that. Okay? We are not good mind changers in the world. We, in fact, we actually celebrate the opposite. Oh, so-and-so. He'd been the same my whole life. And we say that like that's the highest compliment that you can give someone is that they think exactly at 60 like they did at 20. Good Lord, who wants to be that? Did you remember what you thought at 20 or 30 or 40? Did you remember some of the stuff you were adamant about that was real that you needed to die for? And now you look back and go, oh man, I'm glad that you get to change your mind. The things aren't all okay. Well, that's a process, though. That did not, you didn't flip a switch. You just you 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 grew up. Life changed. You moved on. Different people crossed your path. Different ideas. So the process of mind change isn't light switch. The process of repentance isn't light switch. That's what I found. I'm still wrestling with stuff with God that I go, okay, I'm getting there. I don't I don't think like I did six months ago. I don't think like I did six years ago, but. I'm not there yet, you know. I, I, I think we sp still got two or three more rounds in us, God. I got a couple more elbow drops I want to try out on you before we solve this issue. And, and I'm going to try it. I'm, I'm going to give it my best shot. But in the end, I'm the one that needs to change my mind about God. God doesn't need to change his mind about me. Okay, so starting blocks are always repentance. And, and I want to remind you something about a repentance that it's easy to forget. Because most of us cut our teeth on a repentance of pain, self, um, asceticism, you know, I'm pitiful, God, please forgive me, I'm a worm, I'm nothing, I've done this, and when we list off all the stuff we've done, and, and, and it's down, face down in the carpet, and 
highly emotional. And because of that, repentance is just a negative word for most of us. But I, want to, I hope that you can start to turn that boat around and realize that repentance is the most hopeful thing a Christian has. And here's why. Because repentance means there's the possibility that you could be different. The fact that you can change your mind means you could change your world. So it's the starting blocks of a brand new tomorrow. So really, repentance ought to be the most hopeful thing we offer people. Is to say, hey, and this is why you've heard me say before, I actually believe in daily repentance for Christians. I believe a little bit every day of, Father, there's some stuff that i got to change my mind about. I, I, I'm learning more and more about your love for me. I'm learning about your mercy for me. I'm learning about how you feel about the world. And I've been really adamant about some stuff, God, I'm just not real sure about anymore. And if that means, if that's the case, then it could be a better tomorrow than there is today. And so I know I'm beating a, de a dead horse. You guys got repentance. You're constantly changing your mind. But at the same time, I don't ever want us to grow wearied with the idea that repentance is in our rearview mirror where we go, yeah, I remember when I repented one time. I go, one time? <laughs> People go, I remember when I had to repent of that. The Lord, and I think, man, that's, God bless you that you've only been, had to, there was only one or two things you had to change your mind on your whole life. Teach me. Teach me. I want to learn at your feet what it means to be that confident and that assured. And so it isn't the mark of high spirituality to not have to repent. It's the mark of being human and journeying in him and realizing that there's hope. All right, so, so repentance is my work. All of that just to say repentance is my work. Now, now, I'm on my way to refreshing, but there's a pit stop in verse 18 on your, on, sorry, in verse 19 on your way to refreshing. And here's that pit stop. Repent, therefore, and be converted. That's the pit stop because we're on our way to refreshing, but Peter doesn't just jump from repent, refresh, because for Peter, there's an action in there that is closely associated with repentance. The word conversion is epistropho in the Greek, and epistropho means to turn towards something. So he back to back gives you change your mind, turn toward. Repent, convert is change your mind, turn toward. So to convert then is not merely to have a mind change, it's to have a directional change. So if I'm moving down the road, I've changed my mind about God, my life, the world, my situation, other people, myself, whatever. My mind shift leads to a conversion. Repentance leads to a turn. So repentance is the beginning, it's not the end, is my point. Repentance gets me started. Repentance is me going, I can see this differently than I used to. Okay, now, what are you going to do with it? You're just going to repent and then, mm. okay. Or do we want to repent as in, I can see it different. My mind is changing. What step am I going to take now with the new information? Because I told you, he finished the work, but I'm unfinished. He fulfilled, but I'm repenting, so I'm meeting his finished work with my mind change, and I'm meeting it with my conversion. Now, most of us in Christianity, when we use the word conversion, we think initial salvation experience. If I were to say to you, when did you get converted? That's a code word for when did you get saved, which in most of our vernacular is a code word for when did you pray the sinner's prayer? which is the moment that preceded, when did you get water baptized? Notice how we've got all these, they're like daisy chaining back in these events. And they're, they're almost like Christian code words that in some ways we've lost the real intent of. And here's one of the early sermons in the New Covenant where Peter doesn't have a deep theology. He's not running around with Pauline letters under his arm, preaching Galatians and Ephesians and 1 Corinthians. He's just listening to the Holy Spirit. I mean, my goodness, he preached the message of the Pen at, on Pentecost one chapter ago. Like, a few days ago, he preached at, at Pentecost. So his whole theology is not really that well formed. And yet, the first message is not, hey, go do the Ten Commandments, live the law. No, that's our, the Holy Spirit's already starting to strip that stuff out. But what's left is, change your mind about God, because odds are you got some really bad ideas about God. He's not what you think he is. He looks more like Jesus than he does anything else. To me, that's been my favorite wrestling that I've had in my adult life is God looks more like Jesus than I ever thought. And anywhere that I don't think he looks like Jesus, I need to repent. 
and anywhere that I'm still looking at God and I'm going, yeah, but he did this to the Philistines or this is what he looked like to the Assyrians or this is what Elijah would have thought. What I need to do is take all that to Jesus and say, I changed my mind about dad. Dad looks like you. Dad's always looked like you. Dad always will look like you. That's been a great journey. That's kind of Peter, where Peter starts is to say, okay, repent, convert. Once you turn, you realize your sins, then the sin issue gets taken care of in God. And I think what Peter's really doing is laying out the case that we're done with lambs and pigeons and bulls and turtle doves. You you don't need to go slit something's throat and catch its blood and put it on the altar. It's as simple as change your mind, turn to God. Change your mind, turn to God, he'll take care of the sin issue. That sounds, that sounds like the message of salvation, okay? But conversion, to me, is not a, it's not a one-time event. I can, I can take you back to my initial conversion, like the first time I realized I was putting faith in Christ. But I've had to convert my walk more than once. And by convert, turn. I've had, I've had to turn. <laughs> I'm still, there's some moments where I'm still turning. It's like a really big wheel, you know? And I mean, I'm still, <laughs> still turning. Mine changed a long time ago. This is a big boat to turn around. I got a big old iceberg I'm going to crash into. It takes a long time to turn this thing around. And I'm still turning some stuff because the conversion is a life of following the Spirit. And the Spirit will move the wind blows where it, li- where it wants to, and you hear the sound thereof, but you do not know from where it comes or where it goes, such as everyone born of the Spirit. That's what Jesus said. Did you notice he said, such as everyone born of the Spirit? It's you he's talking about. That there's, sometimes there's no rhyme or reason about what, where you're going to go next, but you're following the Holy Spirit, and you're moving like the wind. and the whole, it's, like, it's like that feather that falls. Did you ever see Forrest Gump? It opens with that feather. The wind blows that feather. And then you got the whole movie and you forgot about the feather. And then you get to the end of the movie and there's the feather. And it's kind of like his whole life was like it could go to the left and go to the right. Before you know it, you're returning kicks on a football team and you're fighting in Vietnam and you're owning a shrimp and boat. And, it's like all, and I'm not claiming that, that was a symbol of the Holy Spirit. But in a way, it's kind of playing off that motif of we let the Holy Spirit lead our life. We... The secular view is we just sort of let life happen. And we go where it goes and we see what happens and we get lucky sometimes. But the, the Jesus view of life is we follow the Holy Spirit. The wind blows where it wants to and we trust him and we convert our way to his way because there's going to be parts of me that goes, no, I want to do this. And yet I'm following the spirit, letting him do that. And so that's a process of learning. So that, that's a little bump in the road on the way to my favorite one. This is, this is really where I want to land with you tonight is refreshing. All right. Um, because the times of refreshing that happen in the middle of verse 19, the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. I love that plural. It's not the time of refreshing. It's the times. Because I cannot tell you the times I've needed refreshed in my soul. And this message is not, again, I want to go back to what I said at the beginning. It's not, I accepted Jesus and I'm a lump laying here and then he pushes me or he drags me. This is my participation. And my repentance and my conversion anticipates times of refreshing. But in the same way that I repent and I convert, I believe That as I follow the Spirit, I participate in the very refreshing times of my life. The Greek word for refreshing is anapsuxis. Big word, don't worry about it. Uh, You're not going to need to use it unless you somehow start needing to speak classic Greek. But (laughs) what it means in the English, I know refreshing is a really good translation, but I love this, the depth of this word. It means a cooling off or the obtaining of relief. So you're, you're running hot and you're exhausted. And Peter uses a word that God in the moments when you're running hot and you're exhausted has times, plural, times in which he refreshes you. And when we participate in this, I think if we'll listen, what refreshing is, is rearranging. We're not rearranging the code of salvation, We're rearranging the ingredients in the recipe of our salvation, I think, of our journey. We're just rearranging those those ingredients until 
we find a place of life. Let me, let me just give you some ideas what I mean. Um, about eight years ago, the Father took us out of pastoral ministry in a traditional sense and into itinerant ministry, and He accompanied that with a geographic move that moved us from the middle of the country to the other side of the country. And I don't know that we really understood at the moment how important the geographic move was because for everything that the Holy Spirit wanted to do to restore and refresh us, we needed in some ways a complete severing of where we were because sometimes where you are has its tentacles so deeply connected in the core of you that transformation becomes almost impossible because there are so many things that keep pulling you back um, because you know everyone and you've, you've been there too long. And it's not, I don't think it's universal. I don't, I, I don't tell the Holy Spirit how to do it, but we didn't know what was going on at the time. But now looking back nearly a decade later, we go, it was necessary for the Holy Spirit to accompany what he was going to do for us in the spirit by a physical move so that we could sever some of the things that were that were identity for us. We didn't know they were identity, but you sever those things and so that you can reroute them. And, and then that rerouting wasn't in a geographic spot for us. We, we thought it might be like, well, we're going to live here forever. And what we found is that that, that route turned from the geography of where we were and it, it turned very much into, in, in a lot of ways, inward. And so uh, the Father did a work in those moments in building our relationship, our marriage, building our family unit with our kids in ways that I'm not really sure would have been possible where we were because so much of what was linked into the, the ground of that place was torn out and then meshed together. Um, I'm only just now really starting to, to, to comprehend that and to learn that. Um, so in a way, leaving the pastoral ministry we were in was more than just leaving the church. It was leaving everything we had known about church. That was the church I was raised in. I started going to that church when I was in the first grade and then grew up there, lived there, pastored there, watched total transformation in that place. There was a part of me that didn't even know if I could do ministry outside of that. And so part of that severing was to teach me to shift up the ingredients of what ministry looked like. And we had, I had to almost tear the whole thing down so that it could be rebuilt by the Holy Spirit. And I didn't know how much moving away and moving out of that version of ministry was one of the times of refreshing of watching the Holy Spirit wash us off and teach me the love of ministry again by teaching me love of spouse, love of family, love of life to where it wasn't about performing, doing, building, growing. It was about loving, living the abundant life and then letting ministry grow out of that rather than it just being about what you do, letting it become who you are. The Paul that was there then could not do what the Paul is doing here now because I had to have a repentance, a conversion, and then a washing off of refreshing, letting the Holy Spirit do that. But I got to participate in the refreshing by rearranging the ingredients that go into my salvation. Like, like for instance... Um, a lot of people talk about deconstruction, which is sort of the spiritual uh, kind of a buzzword for tearing down the things I've known so that I can reconstruct new things. And I, and I think that's great. I mean, I'm not crazy about the term because it tends to just be about knocking stuff over. And it tends to be people like, I don't need church anymore. I'm still saved. I don't read my Bible. And they just kind of knock everything over until there's absolute chaos and then, you know, two years down the road, they realized they'd kind of like a friend, you know, like somebody to show up at their, you know, birthday party, but they, they burned every bridge they had because all those hypocrite Christians, but I'm still living for God. And I, at the end of the day, I kind of go, okay, we probably could have done this different, you know, instead of taking a sledgehammer to every room in the house until one day the whole house caves in, maybe knocking a well thought out wall down would have been a better bet and you know expanding that room a little bit I hope you can catch my allegory we don't have to knock everything down all right 
And when we knock things down, we got to let the Holy Spirit show us what needs rebuilt. Um, but the times of refreshing are the rebuilding of the things that had grown stale for you. So I want, I want you to think about this tonight. I, I want you to think about your own participation in the times of refreshing. And I'll give you some examples just to help you. Okay? I'm not, you're going to have your own, but I'm going to give you mine. From the time I knew how to read, I read the Bible. I read it because that's what good Christian boys do for a long time. I went into ministry in my teens. Then I read it to preach. And then I read it to argue. Like I needed to know how to win debates. So I would get into it with people about theology and they'd come armed with scripture. And I thought, I've been in this too long. I'm not going to get beat by this dork. So I'm going to, I'm going to get some word. And I would, and, and so I read the Bible. I've read the Bible through more times than I can count in multiple translations, uh, Genesis to Revelation. I'd have done it backwards if I'd have thought there was some, you know, spiritual value to going that way. Um, until I only read the Bible to preach. And there wasn't a lot of life in it anymore. But that's what you had to get up and read at the beginning of the sermon, is Scripture. Un until the Holy Spirit had to prompt me, just stop reading. And that took a real... That, that, took, a, that took a challenge to my spirit. And so I had to shift the ingredients and find life in reading the word. And so I want to give you a challenge. If the Bible is now boring or overwhelming, or the Bible is just something you don't know if it's that important to you, step away from it. Stop reading it. There's a good chance that you've been reading it out of obligation. There's a good chance you've been reading it out of guilt because you think it's what good Christians are supposed to do. There's a good chance that when you do finally read it, you just feel bad about yourself and you feel condemned. And there's also a really good chance in the modern environment of quick social media responses that you're reading just enough of it to weaponize it and use it against people. So you memorize the verse you need to support the point you have. I want to encourage you to lay it down and rearrange the ingredients of your Bible reading. So refresh. Here's your, here's, if you needed someone to give you permission, here's permission to start over. Just put it away for a while. No more weaponry, no more boringness, no more condemnation, no more shame. Don't ever read it for those reasons again. Let it set for a while. And when you go back to it, don't go back to it with any pretense. Don't go back to it with a reading plan. Don't go back to it trying to chalk up two chapters, ten chapters, win Sunday school stars, or argue with people on Facebook. Just go look for Jesus. One verse a day. Maybe the next day, two verses. Go to one of those chapters, got a lot of stuff in red. Just read it. No rules. No regulations. No clocks. No piling it up. Just look for Jesus. When you open it up, talk to the Father before you read. I come with nothing, no pretense, no agenda. I'm just looking for Jesus. That's participation in the refresh of finding joy again in the Word until it starts to become something that feeds your soul instead of arms your attack. And then when it starts to feed your soul, you watch where the Holy Spirit leads you because He's going to lead you to places you didn't know were there. And you're going to see things you didn't, under, you didn't ever know you'd see before. It's just an idea. It's just a challenge. Here, here's another one. Try, try this. I, I prayed for a long time because I knew Christians were supposed to pray. And for a long time, I prayed on my knees out loud, uh, brought a notebook in to write down whatever the Holy Spirit might say to me. I used to pray with a stopwatch because Jesus said, could you not tarry one hour to his disciples in Gethsemane? And I thought, well, if Jesus thought Peter, James, and John should pray an hour, <laughs> I mean, shouldn't I be praying at least an hour? And by the, by the way, I'm a Holy Ghost filled child of God. I should probably be doing better than that. And so stop watch prayer until prayer. I dreaded prayer. 
And then I, and I and thought, I'm not any good at it anyway. I, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just repeating stuff and just kept looking at the watch to see if, you know. You ever tried to do anything for an hour you don't want to do? And you look down, you've been going at it three and a half minutes. <laughs> and you swore you were on like the 40th minute. <laughs> <laughs> Until you hate prayer, and then people get up and talk about how prayer was, communication with God, and it's the, the sweet sp space of, of the presence of the Lord, and you'd think, man, something's wrong with me. Until prayer became a condemning event. I'm going to give you permission to stop praying. Just s dispense of the machinery. Hit the refresh button. And in the refresh, just talk. Till you're done talking to her and when you're done if it makes you feel better just say amen don't have to be formal don't use king james talk don't quote scripture to god just talk to him like he's sitting right there next to you in your house if it's easier for you put you a chair up imagine that jesus is sitting there and just talk to him don't even worry at first about listening you're putting too much pressure on yourself to hear from god a lot of us don't pray because we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to get something out of it instead of just to communicate. So if we didn't get anything out of it, then what was the whole point of that? But all it's really about is me being spiritually formed into the image of God. And if I could just communicate with him, I could start to listen for the first time in my life. And so I just want you to hit the refresh button, all right? Just change the ingredients. You're not as bad at prayer as, we think, as you think you are. And I, you say, how do you know I think I am? Because I've been around a lot of Christians, and almost all of them don't feel very good at prayer. And so hit the refresh button. Get rid of the formality. Lay the stopwatch down. Don't, put, don't bring your notebook into prayer. Don't drag seven books and four translations. Just you and Jesus. And you know, maybe buy a prayer book. Read someone else's prayer once in a while. Because what might be happening is you're stuck inside your own head. And you don't know how to get out of it. And you come in it every day and you say the same thing. And you say it again. 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 And you say amen. And you go, well, what's the point in this? Nothing's happening. Maybe buy a prayer manual and read someone else's prayer. Because maybe someone prayed something in a way that you didn't think to pray it. And you know what? If you can go to church and enjoy communion with believers, maybe hearing someone else pray is okay too. This is just advice. I'm just giving practical stuff. Maybe it's time for a refresh. We repent, we convert, we refresh. Maybe we need to do it with our giving. We've given and we've given and we've given because we had a percentage we were supposed to give. And we don't even know why we're giving anymore other than we're afraid that if we don't give, God will curse us. I want to encourage you to stop giving for a little while. Just stop giving. And let the Holy Spirit show you where you're feeding. And as He shows you where you're feeding, give as the Holy Spirit directs you to, to give. And I think you'll find that it's not a calculator gift. i got to give this percentage. It'll be a, a gift out of the Holy Spirit. This is refreshed giving. Paul said we don't give out of necessity. We don't give begrudgingly. In other words, I don't give because I have to, and I don't give when I hate it. So I don't have to give, and I want to love giving. And what I've watched the Lord do as I've moved into that is that I'm able to listen to the sound of the Spirit when He says, I want you to start sowing into that ministry. And I don't have to pull my calculator out to find out if I'm already appropriately giving. I can just say, okay, how much do we give into that? How often do we give into that? It's just following the Spirit. If it's feeding me, I want to give. Now, I got to where I was praying that enough that I started, I started moving that over into the secular realm. This was something I didn't see coming. So if I listened to a podcast and it wasn't Christian, but I got a lot out of it and they said, hey, you know, we, we're listener supported. I would feel like, you know what? I listen to this thing every week. I should probably give. You go, well, yeah, but that's not giving into the work of the Lord. You go, I don't know. How do you know? God loves a cheerful giver. I'm going to give happily. I'm getting something out of what they're doing, so I'm going to give into what they're doing. And if I'm going to take, then I want to be a giver. And what I've watched is that the Holy Spirit refreshed my giving heart to where nothing was going out because it was an obligation or because I thought it was churchy enough, but because it was going out in response to being fed. And when you're giving in response to being fed, it's like paying your check at the end of the meal. You wouldn't dare get up and walk out. You just got fed well. He's like, I'm going to give. I mean, why would I walk in here and expect they're going to cook this food for me? And I don't give anything. And so then life becomes about blessing those who are blessing you. 
until you realize that you're giving in ways you never realized about giving before. This is a refresh on giving. You know what? Maybe church attendance needs a refresh. I think it's what's happening in this room. I think for some of you, you moved out of the traditional church. Maybe you were hurt, spiritual PTSD, you got shell-shocked, you got lied to, you got robbed, you got beat up, you got abused, you got spiritually molested, you got taken advantage of, you got overlooked, stepped on, worn out, worn down. But you didn't stop believing in Him. You just took a step out of what had been traditional. And at first you were probably so happy to be liberated from it. Like, I am so pumped that I don't have to go. And I've heard believers, and I've been there. They go, I'm just, you know, I'm just glad I'm not underneath that weight. And they get so excited to not be under that obligation. But as we change our mind about God and we turn towards His Holy Spirit, times of refreshing start to happen. And lo and behold, look what's happening to you. And here you are. And you didn't even know what you were doing. But all of a sudden, you got yourself a little church. <laughs> because the Holy Spirit, you don't have a church in the traditional sense, but the Holy Spirit still brought His children into the same room. And He moves on them through the Holy Spirit. And they respond to the sound of His voice. And they are meeting their community with whatever the Holy Spirit brings out. And how'd that happen? Times of refreshing. Times of a reset. I know what's happened to me is, is these groups have been a refresh. When we moved to Georgia in 2018, um, didn't exactly know what, I, I, I haven't made a move yet where I knew exactly what God was going to do. I'm, I've grown accustomed to that. In fact, I don't even ask the Lord. I don't need all the information. I'm at that point where I'm like, I can get like bare bones info. Now, you can just almost like point the way and I'll give it a shot. We'll just go and just see what you do. And I mean, I've walked on the water before and I've sank and it's not so bad sinking because he always pulls you up. And that's a pretty good gig back to the boat, by the way. I've always thought we don't give that walk back to the boat enough credit. Can you, you know, we always think Peter probably felt stupid, but I just think he felt wet. <laughs> He's still holding hands with Jesus all the way back to the boat. He still walks on the water all the way back to the boat. That's pretty sweet. And I go, well, if we sink, he doesn't let us drown because it's not in his heart to let us drown. So let's go sink. It's good to sink with Jesus than to sink without him. And so I don't need a lot of details anymore as we go. We're, you start to feel the stir. God puts the spot. You go, we'll figure it out when we get there. Watch what God does and watch what God has done. And, and so... For us, all of this has been a refresh. It's been falling in love again with the same group of people. For several years in this journey, it was a different group for me every weekend. And for a while, I was absolutely positive that's the call. That's exactly what you're supposed to do. And part of it for me was that it wasn't the same group every weekend. That I didn't get invited to come and visit their hospital bed. Or I didn't get crashed in on on my day my time off with a three-hour counseling session trying to fix someone's marriage that was doomed or trying to help their kid or and and didn't face the same every time every week and so for me it was that was a refreshing was for the father to go i'm going to show you the joy again of teaching the word to hungry people who aren't asking anything of you other than the word and so i got to go into a different church and a different living room and a different hotel conference room and a different pool house and a different backyard and a different arena and a different church and whatever and share the gift that i had and and found such joy until i have watched seasons change times change and this and what we do in flowery branch were were moments of convenience they were us just saying okay it's like somebody going would you come over every month and we going okay i mean we moved here to say okay let's say okay and then watching as the holy spirit poured times of refreshing on and what you still have value in this arena in this area until what had lost its hope and its life starts to get it back so whatever is lost its 
life for you. Whatever's lost that spark for you in that in this journey with the Lord. That's the place to repent and convert and expect the times of refreshing and watch the Holy Spirit do that. And it's going to require you. This is the most painful part is that it might require you to let go of some stuff you've held on to because that's part of repent and convert. You do have to do something. You are not a slug on your way to heaven. Jesus saved this slob, and now he's just going to drag you by the Holy Ghost chain all the way to glory, whether you like it or not. No, he, he's, he's saying to you, come on, get up. Let's walk. Don't atrophy your legs. I got some stuff that this could be so much better. I know you're hurt. I know you're tired. I know you're worn out with this. That's okay. Lay that down. Get ready for the times of refreshing. Try it differently. Listen to my spirit. I'll teach you how to pray again. I'll teach you how to read your word again. I'll teach you how to give again. I'll teach you what church could look like again. It's not got to be one way or the other. It's just got to be the Holy Spirit way. And it doesn't have to be that way forever. It's the times of his refreshing. It's the times of him cooling you off and giving you of his spirit. Finally, I won't spend as much time here because in reality, this is our most eschatological part. This is, end of, this is the end of the line journey for us. And that's restoration from verse 21. Heaven must receive Jesus until the times of restoration. The word restoration is apocatoskesis. It's a big old Greek word that's actually, oh man, it's beautiful. Because apocatoskesis really means to set stuff in the right place. And so I like how Peter says, repent. Get ready for a refreshing because the time is coming when Jesus is going to set everything in place. Now, the reason I say it's eschatological is because here's my end of the world. As far as I'm concerned, if you go, how do you think everything ends? Apocatoskesis. Christ sets everything in order. What do you think that looks like? That's a great question. I, I don't know what that looks like. I know that he knows. I know that I repent and convert and expect times of refreshing in anticipation of Christ setting everything in order. And I think it's both in the micro and the macro. Okay? In the macro, he's going to set everything in order. I don't know how he's going to do it. I don't know when he's going to do it. I'm really excited he's going to do it. Christ wins. What he did at Calvary and what he did at the resurrection is the end game of heaven, and he's going to win. And I love that Paul said, Christ is all in all. That everything is in Christ. I'm good with that. How does Jesus do it? However he does it then, it's going to look like how he did it when he was here. Don't worry. He doesn't go off and turn into Rambo and come back and use the ways of the devil. However he did it when he was here is exactly how he's going to do it when he does it here again. And I say thank you, Jesus, for that. Same yesterday, today and forever. In the micro, I repent, I convert, I refresh with his help. He sets everything in order. I don't know how he does it, but I like watching. I like being there. He moves little pieces in order. So though he's not dragging, (laughs) <laughs> and he's not pushing, he's moving. And he's saying to me, come on, watch this. I'm going to get you to participate in this. And he rearranges, I like to say, I think we said this a couple Tuesday nights ago, he rearranges the furniture in our lives. And I think the way we said it with our group, that, this, that, that was one of those moments in teaching that just happened in the moment I didn't think about. So I put a little thought into it since then, but... Um, He arranges the furniture, but he doesn't do it without your approval. So the Holy Spirit will move. But if you refuse, you can go move it back if you want to. The Holy Spirit will go, okay, that's where you want that chair. And then you crash into it in the middle of the night on your way to the bathroom. (laughs) And the Holy Spirit goes, sure you want to move that chair? And you go, no, I like that chair where it is. And the Holy Spirit goes, okay, cool, so do I. It's a good spot for it. And then that night, you stub your toe again. And the Holy Spirit goes, hey, you want to you move that chair? 
No, I, I love that shit. The beauty is, is he doesn't just forcibly move it. And so I think sometimes some of the stuff we're running into, our crash and our burn and our burnout, is literally the Holy Spirit going, I can move this wall. We're going to knock this down. But you've got to let me set this in order. You've got to participate with me. It's okay. You've got to trust me. You've got to follow me. I won't do it if you don't want to do it. You want to leave that wall there? I'll run into it. Listen, and I mean this. If you want to run into this wall every day for the rest of your life, I will run into this wall with you. If you want to be mad at the world every day, I'll sit right here and listen to you be mad. If you want to be hurt, you want to be down, you want to be discouraged, I will live in the pain with you. If it's happening to you, it's happening to me. You stub your toe on that chair, I stub my toe on that chair. We're not going to move it if you don't want to move it. But the day you want to move it, I got an idea about where it would be better for the traffic flow. <laughs> and then, apocatastasis. He starts to set things in order. And the beauty, this is what I love about the Holy Spirit, is the beauty is that when you finally get all the furniture arranged, when you bring your friends over to show them, you'll tell them how long you put the thought into how this should look. <laughs> and he'll let you have the glory. Repentance, we've got, I think. I don't mean we aren't doing, we, we don't need to hear about it. I think we understand it at least understand it. Refreshing. I really felt that word this week for you. Times of refreshing, learn to participate. Listen to the spirit of what in your life might needs refreshed. How do I refresh it? And don't be scared to mess up. He ain't going anywhere. He's not going anywhere. Don't be scared. I can tell you from experience, you can, you, you can close this and stop daily devotional reading it. And stay with him. And the day is going to come when it'll somehow fall open and Jesus will stand up. And all of a sudden, again, you'll go, that's what it felt like when I first met him. Because it's the times of refreshing, the Holy Spirit not giving up on you. It starts by repentance. It starts by a turning and letting him do that work. Maybe the same way with prayer. I've discovered prayer in a way that I never could have possibly understood before. Little formality, a lot of listening, and good big stretches of me just telling God off. Believe it or not, I'm mean, just telling God what I don't like about what's going on. I think he should do this and that. And let me give you a piece of my mind. I'm going to tell you what I think we should do. And I, this is where you messed up. You go, gosh, you can talk to God that way? Of course you can talk to God. He's not going anywhere. He just listens. He knows I'm just blowing steam. I need to get it out of my system. It's okay. Father's not running off. And then when I get done, sometimes he goes, okay, how about we move that chair? I can't tell you the times he goes, how about we just move that chair? That's, that's the problem. That's what you've been yelling at me for about. Let's just move it. And you go, all right. <laughs> We'll move it. Let's do it your way. <laughs> and then feel like, you know, we accomplished something. I don't know how it's going to happen for you. The, just the word I felt in my spirit for you this week was times of refreshing. Seek them. Ask God for them and ask where you get to participate and then do it. Rearrange the ingredients of your salvation. You're not running away from Jesus. You're not running away from the Father. In fact, you're going to find that sometimes... The very thing that sounds like running away is really running too. It's really running right back into his arms going, I just, want to be, I just want to restore the joy of my salvation. I just want to come back to the place where it was about being with you. And some of this stuff is just getting in the way. And some of this stuff is dragging me down. And some of this stuff I'm stubbing my toe on. And I want to just find out where we could move it. And if, if you'll do the moving, it'll all flow so much easier. Times, times of refreshing. Let's pray. Father, you are good. Thank you for this group. Thank you for this word tonight. I know it's been a little bit of rambling. It's been a little bit of me trying to find where you wanted me to lay my foot down. You told me that when this word came real to me this week to not over prepare. And I don't like that. And so you and I had to have a talk and you won. And I, I like to be better. I like to know better where my foot falls. But I do feel like you have done a work tonight that could not have been done 
if I put too much of my outline into it. And so I don't even know for sure where some of those things fell, but I know that I'm trusting that they fell, as the book of Psalms says, may our lines fall in pleasant places. I'm believing they fell in pleasant places tonight. And I end with, Father, the only thing that you made abundantly clear to me this week for this place is times of refreshing. I think we're going through it together here. I think there are other refreshings that individuals in this room heard you talk to them about as we preached. There's others watching that will watch in the coming weeks and months that are hearing your spirit say to them the areas that they need to start with repentance and conversion and watch refreshment begin and participate wherever you tell them. And Lord, finally, we anticipate the apocatastasis, the restoration of all things. You're going to set everything right. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.